Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck, part 26. Battleship Bismarck owes her place in naval history primarily to the gunnery actions in which she engaged on May the 24th and May the 27th, 1941. On May the 24th, she demonstrated her exceptional striking power. At an average range of 16,000 meters, it took her only six minutes and the expenditure of only 93 heavy shells to sink the largest and most famous British battlecruiser of the day. This lightning success exceeded the most sanguine expectations and showed Bismarck to represent a high point in German naval gunnery. On May the 27th, Bismarck displayed an almost unbelievable staying power. She was also a high point in German shipbuilding. It required the collective efforts of a British fleet of five battleships, three battlecruisers, two aircraft carriers, four heavy and seven light cruisers and 21 destroyers to find and destroy her. In addition, more than 50 aircraft of the RAF's coastal command participated in her destruction. At ranges that diminished to 2,500 meters and brought a proportionally high rate of hits, the following ordnance was fired at Bismarck after the action of Iceland. 380 16-inch shells, 716 6-inch shells, 339 14-inch shells, 660 5 and a quarter inch shells, 527 8-inch shells by Norfolk, 254 8-inch shells by Dorsetshire. A total therefore of 2,876 shells in the course of an action that lasted 90 minutes. The following number of torpedoes were launched. 8 by aircraft from Victorious, 13 by aircraft from Ark Royal with two hits and probably a third, 4 by Cossack, 4 by Maori, 4 by Zulu, 4 by Sikh, 12 by Rodney with one hit claimed, 8 by Norfolk with one possible hit and 3 by Dorsetshire with two hits and possibly a third. On May the 27th, there were a few penetrations of the 320mm main belt, particularly near the port forward 15cm turret. The latter, according to Josef Stadz, started a fire in its magazine. Because of the range of the action, many of the shells struck the Bismarck in her superstructure. As the King George V and Rodney left the scene of the action, Tavi signaled Somerville, I cannot get her to sink with guns. There has been a great deal of discussion as to whether Bismarck sank as a result of the three torpedoes fired by Dorsetshire in the concluding phase of the action or whether she was scuttled. Although I was still on board when the Dorsetshire fired her first two torpedoes around 10-20 hours, I was not aware of the explosions they produced. That fact, however, has no bearing on the question of what damage, if any, they did. I certainly was aware as I left the aft fire control station at about 10.20 that Bismarck was very, very slowly sinking. Heavily down by her stern, she was behaving as though one compartment after the other was flooding, gradually but irresistibly. She showed all the effects to be expected after the scuttling charges had been fired and the seacocks opened somewhere about 10 hundred hours. The settling, the sinking by the stern and the heel to port increased more rapidly after 10.30, so it may be that, with the battleship already extremely unstable, Dorsetshire's third torpedo hastened the end, but it was not responsible for it. I am morally certain that Bismarck would have sunk without this torpedo hit, only perhaps somewhat more slowly. In his final report on Exercise Ryan, Tavi wrote, Bismarck put up a most gallant fight against impossible odds, worthy of the old days of the Imperial German Navy, and she went down with her colors flying. How effective was German gunnery, at least at the beginning of Bismarck's last battle? No casualties or damage to any of our ships during this action on May 27, wrote Tovey in the above-mentioned report. This outcome may seem surprising in view of Schneider's incredibly accurate straddling fire in the first few minutes of the action between 0850 and 0900. But it must be remembered that the crippled Bismarck could not steer a straight course. She kept on heeling to port and turning unpredictably, whereas Rodney, being maneuverable, could take action to avoid Bismarck's registering salvos while the latter was adjusting her fire. And then, at 0902, less than 15 minutes after we opened fire, Schneider's control station in the foretop and our two forward main turrets, Anton and Bruno, were put out of action. Apparently, Albrecht's forward fire control station was also put out of action, at least temporarily, at about the same time. 
This meant that we had been in the fight only a quarter of an hour when the two of our four main batteries and with the foretop, the brain of our gunnery, were knocked out. Bismarck's main fire control station was not well enough protected, a defect common to foretop control stations on all battleships of the time. In the interest of stability, heavy armor could not be installed at that height. After 0910, I was able to fire only four salvos from the aft turrets Caesar and Dora before my own control station was put out of action. That happened just as I had registered on my target, the King George V. Thereafter, Caesar and Dora went on firing under local control, lay well on target, but without the help of a fire control apparatus, could not score any hits. There is no doubt that Bismarck had an outstanding gunnery system and it was very efficiently directed by Schneider and Albrecht. But, because of the number of ships she was up against, their threefold superiority in weight of shells and the constantly closing range, the decisive blows she suffered were delivered quickly and almost simultaneously. To be sure, Tavi's formulation, no damage to our ships, hit the fact that Rodney suffered not inconsiderable damage from her own fire. The blast pressure from her 16-inch guns, which were at maximum depression for the concluding portion of the cannonade, severely damaged deck structure and several guns jumped their cradles. Her guns were depressed to maximum depression at times because the ship's command wished to score hits at or below Bismarck's waterline. These experiences soon led to improvements in the construction of British battleships. A further indication of the condition of Rodney after the battle reached me through a US citizen, George C. Seibold, who wrote to me in July of 1982. As a Lieutenant J.G., Seibold was assigned in 1943 to the Intelligence Volunteer Special Service in London, where he heard that as a result of her sustained firing of full salvos, Rodney was badly wrecked and even her keel had been driven out of alignment. It was understood that either Rodney was not designed to fire broadsides or had failed under that punishment. As Seibold's statement has never been confirmed by another source, however, I am inclined to regard it with considerable doubt. In any case, in June 1941, Rodney entered the US Navy Yard in Boston, Massachusetts for an overhaul and repairs. Her arrival there was observed by a then 16-year-old American, John Love, who wrote to me in 1983 that although apparently the ship had not sustained a direct hit, she showed what appeared to him to be battle damage on her starboard side, presumably from the blast of her guns firing at full depression. If any questions remain on our troubled conscience, it is the reason why Lutians did not attempt to end the terrible and ultimately futile slaughter of the final battle by signaling Tavi, cease fire, Bismarck is scuttling herself, save our survivors. How Tavi would have reacted, I must leave open. To understand the conduct of a German warship captain or task force commander in battle, it is necessary to recall the edict issued by Reda on December 22, 1939. In reaction to the scuttling of the battle-damaged pocket battleship Admiral Graf Spee of Montevideo. This read in part, a German warship will fight with utmost force until she is victorious or goes down with colors flying. Such wording virtually precluded showing the white flag, as the light cruiser Emden had done at the end of her engagement with the Australian cruiser Sydney in November 1914 without diminishing her historical renown. And it was wording to which Lütjens' signal of 2140 on May the 26th corresponded almost exactly. In principle, Reda's directive was as binding as it reads, but in the final analysis, whether or not it was carried out to the letter, depended upon the personality of the on-scene commander. I incline to the assumption that Lutyens was not the man to rise above it, but I cannot and will not say for certain. In the absence of information about the exact time that the fleet commander was killed or possibly wounded, I do not know whether he was physically in condition to have contributed to ending the battle in this manner. Furthermore, if the fleet commander was incapacitated, I do not know how quickly Lindemann learned of it so that he could take over. Viewed as a whole, too many aspects of this complex question remain factually unclear, so I must let it pass. The enemy's detection of the beginning of Exercise Rhine and his almost continuous contact with our task force thereafter resulted in all our encounters being with heavy British warships. In Bismarck's spectacular sea fights, her lightning victory over Hood on May the 24th and her lonely tormented death on May the 27th. Given the drama of what took place, it is easy to lose sight of the fact that the destruction of enemy warships was not the primary aim of German surface forces in the Atlantic and that, viewed strategically, Exercise Rhine was a failure from the moment we left Norway. 
Bismarck did not even come close on one single occasion to carrying out her principal mission of commerce warfare. It is worth taking a look at the overall risk the Seekriegsleitung took in sending Bismarck out and the individual risks Lütjens took in the course of the operation. Concerning the former, the best source is the highest professional witness, Großadmiral Räder, Commander-in-Chief of the Kriegsmarine, who wrote. Whether or not to send Bismarck out presented me with an extraordinarily difficult decision. Some of the conditions on which the Seekriegsleitung based its original thinking on this subject no longer pertained. The sortie of Bismarck was to have been part of a broad operational plan, but now, if she went out, it would be an individual undertaking and there was the possibility that the enemy would concentrate all his forces against her. That seriously increased the risk. On the other hand, the military situation was such that we could not afford simply to conserve such a powerful combatant. Postponing the operation until the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau were again ready for sea might mean that we would never be able to use the new battleships for offensive operations in the Atlantic. It was almost impossible to predict when Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, which were in port in northern France and constantly exposed to attacks by the Royal Air Force, would be combat ready. In fact, neither ship got to sea until they both escaped in February of 1942. Postponing the operation still further, until Tirpitz was operational, would result in at least half a year of inactivity, a period during which the enemy would not be inactive and the situation in the Atlantic would probably deteriorate because of the attitude of the United States, if for no other reason. An extremely strong psychological ground for my decision was the confidence I had in the leadership of Admiral Lütjens, an officer who understood sea warfare and its tactics inside and out. Even as a young officer in the First World War, he commanded a half flotilla of torpedo boats off Flanders. He later became a flotilla chief, cruiser commander and commander-in-chief torpedo boats and was for a long time engaged in staff work. It was when he served as my chief of personnel that he won my special confidence. At one time, during the Norwegian campaign, he replaced the ailing fleet commander in command of the heavy striking forces and finally demonstrated his great ability during the Atlantic sortie of Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. The decision to give the final order to execute the operation was made very much more difficult for me by Hitler's attitude. When I informed him of my plans, he did not reject them, but it was very evident that he was not in complete agreement with them. However, he left the decision up to me. At the beginning of May, he had a long conversation in Gotenhafen with Admiral Lütjens, who described his experiences during the Atlantic cruises of Scharnost and Gneisenau and explained his intentions regarding the tactical deployment of Bismarck. The fleet commander also pointed out that enemy aircraft carriers could be a serious danger for the battleship. After carefully weighing all the circumstances, I gave the order to execute. This excerpt was taken from Erich Räder's autobiography. It was undoubtedly his awareness that the risks would be far greater if the Bismarck were sent out alone that led Lütjens to express certain reservations to Räder in Berlin on April the 26th. At that time, he suggested that it might be better to postpone the operation until Scharnhorst had been restored to combat readiness or even until Tirpitz was operational. Granted, he reverted on his own to the original idea of Exercise Rhine. That the sortie of Bismarck and Prince Eugen should not be delayed. Both of his immediate predecessors as fleet commander were relieved of that command because of disagreements with the Seekriegsleitung. So I think his desire to be in accord with Räder and the Seekriegsleitung was responsible for his reversal, because that was so very obviously what they were striving for. As I interpret Lütjens' conduct, he was going against his better judgment in agreeing to immediate teaspoon deployment of our battleships, which could only diminish their chances of accomplishing anything in the Atlantic. Later, the British saw it just as he had. Russell Grenfell wrote, But happily for us, the Germans decided to expand their capital ships in penny packets. Räder continued, I bear personal responsibility for the deployment of the newest German battleship, just as I do for all naval deployments made during my time as Commander-in-Chief of the Kriegsmarine. I alone bear it. No one forced me to carry out the operations. My decision was based solely on the necessity to fight the enemy in war with every available means and according to all the rules of the military art, and that entails committing one's own forces. To be sure, Räder had not drawn a personal lesson from this so keenly felt responsibility. In chronological order, the risks that Lütjens accepted or could not avoid are detailed below. 
At the end of April 1941, British intelligence learned that the Bismarck had requested fleet headquarters to forward charts, not available in Gotenhafen, for the prize crews she carried. This news strengthened the suspicion that Bismarck was about to undertake an operation in the Atlantic. British intelligence obtained this information by decoding the radio signal by which Bismarck requested the charts. It had recently gained the ability to do so when, during a raid on the Lofoten Islands, the British disabled and captured the German armed steam trawler Krebs, aboard which was a German Enigma cipher machine and supporting material. As a result, British intelligence was able to decode a number of previously intercepted German signals, including this one. The transmission of an Enigma-encoded radio signal from a ship at sea was a normal occurrence. That, in this case, owing to the capture of the Krebs code material, the British could read the signal requesting the charts was an exceptionally unfortunate development which Lutyens could hardly have anticipated. Therefore, he could not avert the risks it involved. In the second week of May of 1941, the British noticed a significant increase in German aerial reconnaissance over Scapa Flow and as far west as the Denmark Strait. They also deduced from a few Luftwaffe radio signals that they decoded that a breakout by Bismarck was imminent. Admiral Tavi directed the cruiser Suffolk and Norfolk to conduct intensive surveillance of the Denmark Strait. This was an unavoidable risk, and the Seekriegsleitung had to live with it unless it was prepared to give up the idea of breaking out into the Atlantic. Lutyens must have been aware that our intensified aerial reconnaissance would not go unnoticed by the British, who therefore had some warning. The Seekriegsleitung had known since at least the middle of April that by March 1941 the British naval attaché in Stockholm, Captain Henry W. Denham, had built up an organization to monitor the traffic passing through the Great Belt. Whether Lutyens knew of this risk, I cannot say. So far as I know, nothing that might prejudice our chances of conducting war at sea happened during our passage during the Great Belt on the night of May the 19th. Either we were lucky or the enemy's organization was not foolproof. The heavy traffic in the Kadegard on May the 20th made it obvious that there was a danger of enemy agents learning about the movements of our task force. The risk increased when the Jotland came into view. I do not know how Lutyens evaluated the danger we faced from agents in Scandinavian waters, but we do know from his radio report that he had misgivings about having seen by the Jotland. That he did not take that risk more seriously may be attributed to the response his radio report brought from General Admiral Karls. As it turned out, the Jotland's reports and its transmission to London led to the loss of Bismarck on May the 27th. On May the 28th, the Admiralty wired Denham in Stockholm. Your 2058 of May the 20th initiated the first of a series of operations which culminated yesterday in the sinking of Bismarck. Well done. On the evening of May the 20th, Vigo Axelsen saw our task force off the coast near Christiansand. His ensuing radio message confirmed for the Admiralty Denham's earlier report. Whether Lutyens took a risk of this nature into account is beyond my knowledge. Even though Axelsen's message did not tell the Admiralty anything new, it was extremely valuable confirmation. After entering the fjords near Bergen, we spent a whole day within reach of British short-range aerial reconnaissance. Tavi wrote later, Bismarck and Prince Eugen were contemplating a raid on the ocean trade routes, though, if this was so, it seemed unlikely that they would stop at a place so convenient for air reconnaissance. This was a risk that Lutyens did accept. Consequently, British aerial reconnaissance identified Bismarck and an Admiral Hipper class cruiser around noon on May 21st. Further aerial reconnaissance on the evening of May 22nd ascertained that the task force had left Norway. Upon leaving the fjords on the evening of May the 21st, Lutyens learned that a British radio message had instructed the Royal Air Force to be on the lookout for two German battleships and three destroyers that had been reported on a northerly course the day before. Lutyens, apparently unperturbed, continued on his way. He thereby accepted the risk that the enemy, once alerted, would extend his search to the latitudes through which the task force was to pass. On the evening of May the 23rd, when he first met the Suffolk, Lutyens did not turn away. After the subsequent appearance of the Norfolk, he continued to hold his course, followed by both cruisers. During the commander's conference in the Bismarck on May the 18th, Lutyens had indeed said that should he encounter enemy cruisers, he would attack them if the circumstances were favorable, but that his highest priority would be to preserve Bismarck and Prince Eugen so that they could continue their operation for as long as possible. 
In the above instance, he applied the principle of preserving his ships by pressing on without engaging. In so doing, he may have hoped, not unreasonably in the light of experience, to shake off the Suffolk and the Norfolk during the night. Yet, he thereby unavoidably accepted the risk that he would not succeed and that instead, the cruisers would call up heavier ships. Lutyens was poorly served by German aerial reconnaissance, misinformed about the ships at Scapa Flow in the decisive days and encouraged by Group North to continue an apparently unendangered operation. He did not realize it, but he was in fact operating with his task force in a goldfish bowl. The Battle of Iceland deprived Lutyens of the freedom of tactical decision he had had before he encountered Suffolk and Norfolk the previous evening. Thereafter, the damage that Prince of Wales had inflicted on Bismarck determined the course of Exercise Rhine. It forced Lutyens to head for the west coast of France through an ocean area that could be covered by British long-range area reconnaissance. The pursuit of Bismarck, which began on her 1,700-mile run for Saint-Nazaire, was fraught with almost unbearable suspense on both sides. It led to exciting changes of fortune, hopes alternately rising and falling, and continuous fluctuations between high optimism and profound disappointment. The enemy lost contact with Bismarck and regained it. We suffered from the hits scored by Prince of Wales and from our failure to take on fuel in Norway or from the Weissenburg which prevented us from steaming at higher speeds and thus, perhaps, saving ourselves. Then, there was the rudder hit that crippled our ship and led to her destruction, the end of a journey nearly 3000 nautical miles in length which, since her discovery in Norway, had brought Bismarck nine-tenths of the way to her destination in France. The loss of the ship and most of her crew was a bitter, hard-rending blow. But it remains to be said, and in the interest of historical truth, it must be said, that in view of the risks that the Seekriegsleitung and Lutyens knowingly accepted, the loss could not be ascribed to an unforeseeable fate, nor was it tragic in the classic sense, because it was not the result of a fatal flaw in the character of the fleet commander. The sinking of Bismarck had a decisive effect on the war at sea. Shortly thereafter, British forces sank six of the steamers belonging to the resupply organization for the conduct of the war in the Atlantic, thereby dealing that force a devastating blow. It was no longer possible for our surface forces to undertake large-scale operations of any duration in the Atlantic. Tavi's words of May the 26th came true. The sinking of the Bismarck may have an effect on the war as a whole, out of all proportion to the loss to the enemy of one battleship. It has been nearly 50 years since the Bismarck sank on 1039 hours on May the 27th, 1941. She lies at 48 degrees 10 minutes north and 16 degrees 12 minutes west not very far out in the North Atlantic and yet the distance of an eternity from the shores of France. The end of her brief career foreshadowed the passing of the battleship era of which she was a technological triumph and upon which she and her brave fallen crew left an indelible mark. An indelible mark indeed, considering we are still talking about Bismarck today, over 80 years after she sank. In this episode we have learned a lot about why Exercise Ryan failed and why the sinking of Bismarck had such a profound effect on the war. One can hypothesize what would have happened had the big ship survived, but Allied air power would have at some point taken her out, I'm sure, just like her sister ship Tirpitz. Mass aerial attack and even the advent of guided munitions such as the Fritz X glide bomb made the task of the battleship that much harder. Even though conventional gunnery still had some role to play, as it was possible to hit large targets very far out. To remind you, HMS Warspite hit the Italian battleship Giulio Cesare at over 25,000 yards and as such is tied with Scharnhorst, who hit HMS Glorious at about the same distance. The great and mighty Yamato, with relatively primitive fire control for the time, managed to hit the small destroyer USS Johnston at a range of 20,000 yards with three shells out of a full salvo while Johnston was steaming away at flank speed. But as we know now, even the biggest ship can fall victim to air attack. Anyway, Bismarck will forever be remembered as well as the Hood and the entire action has gone down in history as one of the most famous naval engagements of all time. I hope you've learned something new from the account of Burkhardt and in the next episode he'll tell us what it was like being a British POW. I will see you then. Cheers and bye bye.